I'm Darius McDermott from Fund Calibre, and this is the Investing on the Go podcast. Today, I'm particularly delighted to be joined by John Irons, who is CEO of Lion Trust. As regular listens, listeners to the podcast will know, normally we talk to fund managers about asset classes and regions, and we thought it would make a nice change to actually talk to somebody who runs an asset management business. So, John, thank you very much for taking some time to talk to us today. Thanks, Darius, and it's uh, good to be here. So look, um, I've known you for a long time. We've been around um, for several of these dicey markets. Um, this one as as much as any. Um, how did it feel being a CEO of a asset manager business during the extreme market falls in February and March? Um, I suppose, like many things, you you continue to try and you know prepare for things. And as you say, you know, we've been around for a while. In my thirty two years, I've seen you know sort of market corrections and and shocks and things, but I think you know, this one was uh, totally different. And, and different in so much as obviously, you know, nobody predicted you know, what was going to happen. But it happened at a time when, you know, economies were operating relatively efficiently and there wasn't too much stress in the system. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, you know, as, as we got to see um, what was happening and the spread of the virus and the slowdown coming in place, it was, you know, important for us to sort of get to grips with what we we're going to do, where, you know, how we'd operate. It became sort of clear a couple of weeks before we all sort of departed our offices that that was the position we were going to get into. Um, and so, you know, we had to, you know, to plan to take effect of that. You know, at Lion Trust, you know, we we're very fortunate that we, we were a strong belief in sort of embracing that working from home culture in looking at, you know, how we improve, you know, sort of work-life balances for people, operating on the best on assumption that, you know, if you want to attract the best talent, be it in fund management, sales, marketing, or the administration side of the business, you've got to create the right environment for people. But, you know, so we had plenty of experience of operating like that, but I suppose the big challenge was taking 10, 15%, you know, of the workforce and applying that principle, you know, across the whole company to 100%. Um, and uh, yeah. how, how was that just from a technology point of view? And I know a number of your fund management teams, as you, were, as you stated, already work from home a majority of the time. But moving sort of a, an entire firm, not just fund managers who clearly need their Bloomberg terminals, et cetera, what challenges did that bring up for you? And there's, sometimes, you know, you get lucky um, in, with, with these things. Uh, with the acquisition of Neptune that we made last year, we'd only just finished integrating them into our office. So that it meant that, uh, you know, when when we had to start moving people away, the core kit you need, what it was sort of referred to as you know, sort of the golden nuggets these days, you know, hard drives, uh, screens, we had an excess supply of those. So, you know, phase one in terms of actually kitting people out, you know, we got lucky there. Uh, from that point of view, the other side of the business is that you know uh, we stress process not just through fund management but through sales, through marketing, uh, administration, you know, all, all the time. And we have a phrase internally, which is, if you like, the relentless pursuit of the basics. We know that you know every day we come to the office or we don't come to the office in this environment. We do the day job as well as we can, day in day out. That will give us the edge. So having those sort of rigorous and very robust processes across all aspects of the business, allowed us, you know, once we started to separate from the, the central core of our offices, uh, to continue, if you like, with, with the daily routines and process there. And so we had inbuilt checklists to go back to uh, from that. Now, there were all sorts of different ways, um, you know, to communicate. And, you know, the way we're doing this Zoom call now, you know, one of the things we have seen probably is five years of change you know, in five, ten weeks now. Yeah. So the, of the technology, the technology that always existed, you know, for the last two or three years. But now the fact that people have been forced towards that change, you know, we've been able to embrace it across the business. And do you think that will um, carry through to sort of fund manager meetings with clients when we are all able to be together again? Do you think that there's more likely that <laughs> now this Zoom meeting, because you always, you know, the, fund buyers want to look the fund managers in the eye yep. and you know that more often than not they were done face to face yeah there was always that bias uh, there beforehand that 
you know, uh, clients would like to see fund managers in a one-on-one -on -one basis. But, you know, very much with the sustainable team, we'd used a lot more video conferencing um, with them before. Um, the adoption, and I think the fact that it's worked so well um, for fund management meetings, I think means that we will we will continue to have you know a very high content of that. It makes you know um, everybody's working day much more efficient. And I'd go in, even as we start to open offices up and move back towards that. I realise that you know the environment of social distancing uh, will be in place. People will be worried about commuting and travelling. Uh, so there'll still be a very high degree, um, you know, 80, 90% of meetings, I should think, coming up towards even to the year end will be, you know, through through these medium. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree with you pretty much entirely there. Do you, I mean, you talked about that sort of five years in five minutes type of change that, that, that we've had enforced on us from a technology point of view. We've had to learn to use Zoom and switch our cameras on and our all these sorts of things. But do you see as a CEO of a business any more structural change? Do you think that working from home culture will be more prevalent? You might need less office space, more hot desking. Do you see any sort of meaningful change that, that, that the pandemic has caused going forward? I I think there's, there's – there's, I've looked at a lot of um, – you know things over the last ten weeks, and look to see. You know what? Have, what have we learned? What did we used to do? How do we do things now? And what are the positives we can take from this to change? You know our business and develop it going forward. And I think you know a lot of this use of technology means that we can um, incorporate it into you know getting a much better work life balance um, for for our employees. I think it means we can get information much more timely out to our clients. You know, the utilisation we've done with you know, setting up portals for, for, for regular video updates from fund managers, for being able to do closed webinars in, in people's offices and, and, and multiple offices at the same time. So I think that will help there. I think we'll have more hot desks. I think, you know, there's differences across the company and there is a bit of a sort of an age into it. I think, you know, a lot of the younger people in the office, um, a lot more of their social life, you know, comes around those. And so some of the softer things that are still as vitally important in building a culture inside of a business, they're important. So, you know, we'll still have office you know, facilities where people will still come in. But I think what we will start to do is start to think more about teams you know, coming in for specific days, maybe Tuesdays, Thursdays, other teams, Mondays, Wednesdays, and giving people that time, you know, to work from a home. I certainly think, you know, on the research side, on the fund management side, you know, the ability to operate in isolation, especially in times of, you know, such volatility in stock markets, actually to be able to get away from that noise and just to go back to your checklist to look through, you know, stock selections all the time to, to absorb it. The information um, in in that sort of isolated environment can very much be seen as a positive. So, just from a fund caliper's perspective, then we rate several products from your um, UK franchise at the Economic Advantage team, which um, we've been familiar with for a very long time. What do you think it is about that team, particularly, that it's made it so strong? But not just so strong, but you know, the consistent level of outperformance that they've managed to deliver on the longer standing products and actually now the, the newer product, which of course is the micro cap fund, which has got off to a tremendous first three, three and a half years. I think, you know, that team led by Anthony Cross with Julian Fosh, Victoria Stevens, Matt Tong, and now Alex Wedge in it there, you know, just shows, you know, how you can take over the 10 years I've been involved with it, but the 20 years where they've produced, you know, outstanding, you know, um, returns from the funds shows you know the importance of process there you know there were there is a beautiful simplicity to the economic advantage side you know they're looking for that intellectual property you know strong distribution barriers to entry recurring incomes looking for companies that have got you know strong margins generate good cash flows you know providing that sort of higher return on the on your invested companies and and selecting those companies that you know are you know, going to compound and do 
you know, their job year after year after year and win faith in those companies. Now, you know, there's a beautiful simplicity to that, but there's an awful lot, you know, of rigor and, and process that goes into identifying and selecting those companies. And to always, but to always have a checklist to go back to. So, you know, so when you get periods of extreme volatility like we're seeing now, is, well, why did I buy that company? Or the, or do these reasons still hold good? Do they not? Has anything changed in that you know, connection? And that, you know, often you need to ask those questions nearly on a daily basis, you know, of those businesses. And if the answer is, to, is, is no, nothing has changed, despite the short-term noise of the stock market, you know, you know that's a good investment. You know, so often where you see, and you're right, you know, there's an exceptional team that's produced fantastic returns over, you know, over a long sustained period of time. And it's been through many market cycles. So having those, that reference point, that process that acts at that anchor through, you know, periods of uncertainty is vital. And you see it with, with, with other, you know, teams where, you know, managers have moved away from what their initial investment criteria were because of the outside noise and you lose the effect of your process and your performance suffers. So, you know, I think it's an incredibly talented group of individuals with, a, you know, an excellent process. And they themselves will say that what they do is they, you know, they just focus relentlessly on checking that and, and, and making sure that it does it. And that produces you know, those exceptional returns. The other... Um franchise which you very cleverly got in I think nicely ahead of the game is the ESG or sustainable uh, investing you brought a team in um, several years ago and the monthly income bond is rated by fund caliber uh, just as a, a, a good high income corporate bond fund not the fact that it's responsible investing um, obviously it's a nice extra to have do you think that the ESG, which was very topical in the last couple of years in our industry, is a sustainable thing? I don't want to use the pun sustainable, but um, or, or, or do you think this is just one of those trends that we do see come and go? No, I mean, I think um, when we acquired the business three years ago, it was a business I was interested in five years before that. I think, you know, it's one of the big drivers. I think if you look at, you know, people talk about, you know, is this a tipping point for, you know, sustainable investment? It's been rising up the agenda, you know, for a long time. You know, the, you know it's reflection of, you know, the way the economy has worked for a long time. There's always been progress for, you know, cleaner air, cleaner environment, more fuel efficiency, you know, development throughout the world. But I think now, you know, there is a very, you know, good focus on that. And I think, you know, the sustainable credentials, things that you look for, or things that are reflected in sort of, you know, quality management. I think but if you look at, you know, the recent correction in the stock market, people have sort of looked at it and thought it was a fairly indiscriminate, you know, fall. But if you look back over the last sort of few months now, you can see <coughs> that there has been a bigger bias towards sustainable, you know, in companies. You know, they've performed significantly better than companies that would say screen poorly for ESG environment. So I think that whole concept of, you know, sustainable investing is a nice to have in a bull market. I think that myth has been completely debunked. And if you look at what how things go forward and, you know, the importance um, of, of that, and, and, you know, no more, more so now that, you know, improvements in healthcare, improvements, you know, in, um, in sustainable resources um, will become more and more you know, of in, take more and more of investors' focus. And you did touch on briefly the fact that you've been at Lion Trust for 10 years. Um, it doesn't time fly when you're having fun, but it, Lion Trust has been totally transformed in that period of time. It's been one of the few asset management companies which has consistently been able to post positive flows, both from a net and a gross basis. What next for Lion Trust, John? What, what's, what's, what's the next phase? Um, I always say that, you know, the key is just to continue to do the things that we are doing. You know, we're well, you know, the growth of the business you know, has been 
uh, exceptional over the last 10 years. It's, it's, that's based on a tremendous group of people and talent um, in the business and, and a very clear focus on what we do. You know, we say we, we don't have a crystal ball going to where markets you know, are going to be. And none of that's predictable, but you know, we know that process should be predictable and process across all parts of the business. And as I say, you know, if we do the day job day in, day out as best we can, we know that will give us, you know, an edge on the others. There'll be plenty of opportunities, you know, for us to grow the business. Um, you know, through periods like this, I can't tell you where flows will be. I can't tell you where stock markets are going to be. But I know that you know, it's a good, good opportunity for us to improve our market share in the industry, uh, to take things forward, and but very much to stay focused on the plan we've got. And the plan has always been, you know, organic growth. If we can, you know, first and foremost, those are the things that myself, the management team, the employees inside the business can affect on a day-to-day basis. Um, We'll look to hire in new teams where we believe they've got good, strong investment process. Um, but, you know, we don't try and be all things to all men. We just look for the areas where we think we can deliver you know, a compelling proposition. And the other side will be, you know, acquisitions, which we have made in the past. But, you know, just because, and you've seen it now, just because things get cheaper, it doesn't mean that they're, they're good businesses. So you've got to have a clear focus, you know, of what you want to do, what you want to develop. Um, there are plenty of things that, that we can do and continue to add value with the existing business that we've got. And I think you know, those are the things that we're going to concentrate on first, you know, first and foremost. John, thank you very much um, for that insight from the sort of the top of a fund manager business. As I say, we've had um, many fund managers from all over the world talking to us about their asset class and their geographies. And I think it's been um, refreshing to hear from uh, an investment person, but not a, a day-to-day investor. So I really appreciate you um, taking the time in what, what are you know, unprecedented times and, and really busy for everybody. So thanks very much, John. Pleasure. Thanks very much, Doris. Um, um, for more information on any of Lion Trust's uh, elite-rated funds, please visit fundcaliber.com. And to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, please visit your usual podcast subscriber or at fundcaliber.com. Please note that these are unprecedented times and markets can react very quickly to news. The views expressed here are at the time of recording and could obviously change. Please remember, we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these stocks at the time of listening. 